Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. Recently, my company decided to open a new office in Milwaukee, and they wanted all remote workers to come in for a week-long orientation and team building session. Not exactly my cup of tea, but hey, it's part of the job. So there I was boarding my flight from Denver to Milwaukee. The past few days had been hectic, packing, making arrangements for my cats, and trying to wrap up some pending projects before the trip. All I wanted was a smooth, peaceful flight where I could catch up on some sleep. Everything was going fine until we were ready to take off. The plane was fully boarded and we were just sitting at the terminal. The flight attendants had made several announcements asking passengers to put their electronic devices in airplane mode and stow them away. But there was this guy about two rows in front of me who apparently thought he was above such trivial rules. He was having what seemed to be a business call, speaking loudly enough that several rows of passengers could hear him discussing some sort of merger details. The flight attendant approached him with a warm smile and politely asked him to end his call and put his phone in airplane mode so they could begin takeoff procedures. The guy just waved his hand dismissively at her, continuing his conversation as if she wasn't even there. The flight attendant tried again, apologizing for the interruption but explaining that over a hundred passengers were waiting for takeoff. The guy kept talking on his phone, only briefly acknowledging the flight attendant to tell her that he was in the middle of something important. The flight attendant calmly explained that airline safety regulations required all devices to be in airplane mode before takeoff, and they couldn't proceed until he complied. She stood by his seat, not backing down. Finally, he ended his call with an exaggerated sigh, complaining loudly about how ridiculous it was and how some people actually had important business to conduct. The flight attendant maintained her professionalism, thanking him for his cooperation. As she walked away, signaling to her colleague that we were finally clear for takeoff, the businessman started his tirade. He loudly complained about how rude the flight attendant was, comparing her to a prison guard and demanding if they knew who he was. He kept bragging about being in the middle of a million-dollar deal. I turned to my seatmate, who happened to be a middle-aged woman reading a mystery novel. We shared a knowing look, and I joked about voting him off the island first. She immediately agreed, seconding the vote. The businessman whirled around, informing us that he could hear our conversation. I responded that we could all hear him too, and pointed out that he'd held up the entire flight for 15 minutes. Several other passengers joined in, voicing their agreement. The businessman, now red-faced, declared it was outrageous and threatened to file a complaint. The flight attendant had to return and warn him to lower his voice, adding that they would need to take appropriate action if he continued disturbing other passengers. The businessman finally shut up, though he spent the rest of the flight aggressively typing on his phone, in airplane mode finally, and shooting dirty looks at anyone who looked his way. When we landed, I overheard him frantically trying to salvage his million-dollar deal on the phone only to learn that the other party had already signed with a competitor. Apparently, they didn't appreciate being kept waiting on the phone while he argued with the flight attendant. The flight attendant caught my eye as I was deplaning, and I made sure to thank her for handling the situation so professionally. The small smile she gave me suggested this wasn't her first rodeo with entitled passengers, but she appreciated the acknowledgement nonetheless. I'm a single dad raising my six-year-old son. His mom passed away when he was just two, and since then, it's been just us against the world. Yesterday was his first day of summer break, and I promised him we'd celebrate with a trip to the mall and his favorite ice cream parlor. He'd been talking about this special Sunday for weeks. It was this limited edition superhero-themed thing with blue and red sprinkles, cookie crumbs, and a tiny chocolate shield on top. Not cheap at $8.50, but seeing his face light up when the server handed it to him was worth every penny. We were sitting on one of the benches near the food court when this kid, probably around 8 or 9, runs up to us and starts pointing at my son's ice cream, shouting to his mom 
that he wanted that ice cream too. I look up to see this woman in expensive clothes and too much makeup storming towards us. She immediately demanded that I give her son the ice cream. When I asked her to clarify what she meant, she explained that since her son wanted the ice cream and my kid had barely touched it, I should hand it over right away. I calmly suggested that she could buy her own ice cream at the parlor right there. She then started ranting about how that was the last one with the special shield, claiming the server had just told her they were out. She even had the nerve to complain that my kid wasn't appreciating it because he was eating it too slowly. My son was starting to get scared and clutching his ice cream closer. I told her that this wasn't my problem and that she couldn't just demand someone else's food. Her kid starts wailing, doing that fake cry thing some kids do when they want something. The woman then tried to blame me, screaming about how I'd made her baby cry and questioning how I could be so selfish. I snapped back, telling her she could buy her own ice cream and called her a witch. That's when she completely lost it. She tried charging at us, but tripped over her own heels. I bursted out laughing. It was like something out of a cartoon. That really set her off. She scrambled up, looking around like a wild animal, when she spotted the fire extinguisher on the wall. Before I could process what was happening, she'd somehow ripped it off its mount and was charging at me with it raised over her head. My first instinct was to shield my son. I pushed him behind me and tried to dodge, but she was swinging that thing like a mad woman. I managed to avoid a hit to my head, but she caught my shoulder pretty hard. That's when training from my amateur boxing days kicked in. I saw an opening and landed a clean right hook just as she was mid-swing. The hit stunned her enough that she dropped the extinguisher, which then bounced off my already throbbing shoulder. By this point, mall security had finally shown up, followed quickly by the police and emergency medical technicians. Turns out Karen had a history of similar incidents at other stores in the mall. She'd been banned from three shops for threatening employees, but they'd never been able to press charges because she'd always leave before police arrived. Not this time. The police arrested her for assault with a weapon and attempted robbery. The emergency medical technicians checked us both out. I had a nasty bruise on my shoulder and she had a split lip from my punch, which was ruled self-defense given the security camera footage. While giving my statement to the police, the ice cream parlor manager came over. He'd seen everything and insisted on giving my son a fresh superhero sundae complete with two chocolate shields on the house. The look of joy on my kid's face made the whole ordeal worth it. Karen is facing serious charges, and the mall has permanently banned her and her family. Her husband showed up later to pick up their kid, apologizing profusely and mentioning they're in the middle of a divorce, which explains a lot, but doesn't excuse trying to brain someone with a fire extinguisher over ice cream. It had been one of those days at work where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. We had a major system crash that kept me debugging for 12 hours straight. By the time I left the office, I was exhausted, hungry, and in desperate need of some quick groceries for dinner. All I wanted was to grab a few items, get home, and collapse on my couch. The local supermarket was my usual stop. I knew exactly where everything was, and they had these wonderful express checkout lanes for people with 10 items or less. Perfect for someone like me who lived alone and usually only needed a handful of things at a time. I had just grabbed my five items. Some pasta, sauce, bread, cheese, and a bottle of wine. Definitely needed after today. When I spotted the express lane, there was only one person ahead of me, but something immediately caught my attention. Her cart wasn't just holding a few items, it was gradually filling up. This woman, probably in her 40s, was standing there with what looked like 15 to 20 items already on the conveyor belt. I cleared my throat and politely pointed out to her that this was the 10 items or less lane. She barely turned her head, waving her hand dismissively and told me not to be so uptight, saying it was just a little longer wait. I noticed people starting to line up behind me, their expressions darkening as they realized what was happening. But it got worse. Two children, presumably hers, kept running back and forth from the aisles, bringing more items to add to their ever-growing pile. The cashier, a young woman, probably in her early 20s, was visibly annoyed but clearly felt powerless to say anything. 
The line behind me grew longer, with people muttering and checking their watches. Karen finally finished checking out. She turned to me with this smug smile and asked if it really wasn't so bad after all. I didn't respond. I just watched as she and her kids wheeled their overflowing cart out of the store. After quickly paying for my five items, I followed them to the parking lot. They were loading multiple bags into their SUV's trunk, and I had an idea. I pulled my car directly behind theirs, blocking them in. I put it in park, turned on some music, and waited. It took about 30 seconds before I heard the first honk. I looked up and cheerfully waved. Another minute passed, and I saw her door open. She walked over to my window and demanded to know if I could move my car as they needed to leave. I apologized and told her I couldn't. She angrily asked what I meant and demanded I move my car right away. I simply repeated her own words from earlier, telling her it was just a little longer wait. I watched as recognition dawned on her face. Her eyes widened, then narrowed. She spluttered as she realized I was the person from behind her in line. I confirmed this and explained that my car wasn't quite done sitting in park, so she'd just have to wait for me to be finished. She started ranting about having frozen items in her car. I suggested that maybe she should have thought about that before using the express lane for her weekly shopping trip. She stormed back to her car. I could see her gesturing wildly and complaining to someone on her phone. After a few minutes, she came back out and threatened to call security. I rolled up my window and focused on my phone, scrolling through social media, while occasionally looking up to see her growing increasingly frustrated. She came out one more time, practically red in the face, trying to intimidate me by bragging about her lawyer husband. I turned up my music slightly and continued ignoring her. Eight minutes felt like an eternity, probably just like it did for everyone waiting in line while she abused the express lane. Finally, after watching her pace back and forth between her car and mine, I started my engine. But before leaving, I rolled down my window one last time. I threw her own words back at her, asking if it really wasn't so bad after all, just a little wait, and suggested she might have learned something about express lane etiquette. Even better was seeing several people who had been in line behind me in the parking lot giving me thumbs up and smiling. Sometimes a taste of your own medicine is the best lesson, especially when served cold in a parking lot. I've been in the automotive industry for nearly two decades now, following in my father's footsteps. He spent 30 years at Ford, and I grew up hearing all his stories about life on the assembly line. One of his favorites, and now one of mine, was about a manager who learned the hard way not to mess with workers' sick leave policies. It was around 1995 when this happened. My father was working as a senior technician on the assembly line, and they had a pretty reasonable sick leave policy. You could take a single day off without needing a doctor's note. The only time you needed documentation was if you took multiple days in a row or if your sick day happened to fall right before or after a holiday. Then came this new manager, fresh out of business school, wearing suits that probably cost more than what the line workers made in a month. Let's just say he wasn't exactly popular from day one. He looked at everything like it was a problem that needed fixing, even things that were working just fine. One morning, he called a mandatory meeting. He greeted everyone and immediately launched into his speech about how he'd been reviewing attendance patterns. He claimed he'd noticed an alarming trend of single-day absences and announced that from now on, all sick leave would require a medical certificate, with no exceptions. My father told me you could hear the collective groan from the workers. An older worker raised his hand and tried to reason with the manager. He explained that sometimes people just need a day to recover from a migraine or stomach bug, and not everything requires a doctor's visit. The manager was unmoved. He simply said if someone was sick enough to miss work, they were sick enough to see a doctor, and the policy would start immediately. My father decided to speak up next. He warned the manager that this would backfire. When the manager questioned why, my father explained that the local doctors were pretty understanding, and since they'd have to go see them anyway, they'd give as many days as asked for. He reminded everyone that they got 14 sick days a year and suggested they might as well use them properly now. The manager dismissed my father's warning as an unprofessional attitude 
and insisted the policy would stand. And boy, did it backfire. The very next week, three people called in sick. Instead of taking their usual one day off, each of them came back with a doctor's note for five days. The week after that, four more people did the same thing. The assembly line was running on skeleton crews, and productivity took a nosedive. The doctors were totally on board. During visits, they would simply ask how many days were needed and write whatever was requested. They understood that sometimes people just need a break, and being forced to get a medical certificate for a single day was ridiculous. This went on for about two months. What used to be occasional one-day absences turned into what the workers started calling five deities. The factory was losing way more productivity than before, and the higher-ups started asking questions. It all came to a head during a management meeting when the plant supervisor finally had enough. He confronted the manager about how the policy was costing them five times more in lost productivity and demanded to know what he'd been thinking. The manager tried to defend himself by saying he was just trying to reduce unnecessary absences. The supervisor pointed out that he'd managed to do exactly the opposite and announced they were going back to the old policy immediately. The new manager lasted about three more months before being transferred to another department. Fast forward to my story. I just started my first job at a different automotive plant, and during the orientation, our new department manager was giving us the rundown of his improvements. When he announced he was implementing a policy requiring medical certificates for every sick day, I couldn't help but laugh. This earned me a sharp look from him, and he asked what was so funny. I told him that it was actually quite amusing and proceeded to tell him about how this exact policy had played out at Ford in the 90s. As I told the story, you could see the color slowly drain from his face as he realized what would happen. The other managers in the room were trying not to smile. The manager stammered that he needed to discuss this with human resources. Less than two hours later, we got a company-wide email stating that, after careful consideration, the proposed changes to the sick leave policy would not be implemented and the current policy would remain in effect. I saw him in the cafeteria later that day, and he actually approached me to thank me. He admitted that I had saved him from making a huge mistake and acknowledged that sometimes the old ways are the best ways. I responded by explaining that sometimes people just need a day to recharge, and if you treat them with respect, they'll respect you back. He turned out to be a pretty decent manager after that, always asking for input before making major policy changes. I guess some managers can learn from others' mistakes. They just need someone to tell them the story first. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.